My name is Lara Robertson, Design and Specification Manager for Brickworks Building Products. And on behalf of Brickworks, I would like to welcome you all to our Sydney Design Studio and to tonight's Double Talk Speaker Series event, our first for 2017. Before we begin, I would like to welcome Stephen to officially introduce tonight's speakers. Please enjoy your evening. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Double Talk number 23 our first for Sydney for 2017. Today, however, we have a very special, slightly different double talk presentation for you. This was originally Bob Nation's suggestion when I was discussing who we should pair with John Denton. And even though Gary Emery is not officially an architect, he has had an incredible, has had an incredible amount of influence on how certain works of architecture have, have been viewed and experienced, both physically and in published form, but more on that later. So tonight for Double Talk, we bring together an architect and a graphic designer, both from Melbourne, to come and talk to you about their work. We have asked them to give some behind the scenes insights into their projects, and I think we're going to have quite a few insights this evening about briefs, clients, sites, the design process, and especially the relationship to collaborators, because John and Gary have not only collaborated as designers, but also as client and architect on numerous occasions. Okay, that was an incredible presentation from uh, both of you. Although, Gary, yes. you were extremely understated. <laughs> so I have a question for you. Um, and John, acknowledged it and said something that I was thinking all the way through, that despite you saying how that's a bit of simple graphics and it's just a bit of simple text and whatever and you hardly said much about your input, it was when John showed Manchester, he made a statement about how integral and how important your contribution is to that building and also to everything that you two have done together. And I'd like you perhaps to say more than what you've said already about yeah. how you think you have, or what, what your philosophy has been behind what you've done, regardless of you feeling a little queasy about the postmodern stuff, but you have had a philosophy behind what you've done and I'd like you to say a bit more about it, please. Well, Moving I on. think uh, specifically with the work that we have done with DCM, um, both Denton Corker Marshall and ourselves uh, have uh, a, co a common ground in as much as that we both enjoy geometric abstraction and I think we've both been influenced by Russian constructivism or suprematism and um, I think, uh, oddly enough, I don't think John and I ever have discussions about mm. design. I think, um, well, we do. We talk about other people's work probably more than our own. <laughs> but uh, the thing is that um, there are times when I think the gra graphic content in buildings should be very subservient to the architecture or it should be there to be discovered or there are other times when it should um, be stand out and make its own statement and have its own expression and I don't think uh, the highly expressive work uh, that we've done necessarily is appropriate to Denton Corker Marshall's architecture. Mm -hmm. So um, you're meaning your your other work for other people. my other work for yeah. other people, but um, in in uh, I think that their architecture is um, so uh, well considered, and uh, it's very easy to. Um, to design 
something for their buildings that is in complete sympathy or harmony. And I guess what it does, it adds, at some level, at a personal scale, the graphics can add a level of detail and refinement that, in a way, completes the building. I mean, that's not, a, not as a big gesture, but at the human scale. And I think that uh, it's that kind of detail that we're searching for and we're certainly not interested in competing with the architecture. I think it's about having a, a uh, being in harmony with what exists, you know, and understanding what the role of graphics is in the bigger picture. Um, I actually find it very, I don't find it too complex. <laughs> it's just straightforward, isn't it? Yeah. No, but I think it's important for people to hear your explanation of that. We might read into it what we see and how we think the two are working together, but it's very nice to hear your explanation and also that you know that this particular approach or these approaches that you've taken are appropriate to this work, yet others are appropriate elsewhere. And not every designer is like that and not every architect is like that. So I think that's important as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, I mean we, we designed a car park for Nonda mm. Katsalidis. Well, it was Nonda's building, but he had no input at all. And uh, <coughs> it's kind of like what he does is, is kind of to my mind is ad hoc, you know? It's one thing on top of the other, on top of the other, on top of the other. So for us, we can dump something else on there <laughs> and make it as equally as expressive as the architecture, yeah, yeah. you know? And I think that's a perfectly valid uh, approach in that instance. Mm. But, um, but it too is a very clever piece of work and it's in the pamphlet you've got. There's one picture yeah. of it. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's, uh, it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you have a quick question here. <laughs> a quick question. Take as long as you like. <laughs> I, I'm in nostalgic mode. You know, we go back 40 years, so, but I won't ask that. But back in the day when Gary Emery had long blonde locks, he was a handsome young guy, and I'd visit his office in South Yarra, he was crafting a new typeface for the Australian Parliament House. Now that was a different kind of process, I guess, than working with John and Bill and Barry and others. Do you want to comment on, on that kind of uh, design process that was so rich in terms of my experience of your process? Well, and working for a different mm. Working for, in this instance, we were working with Ronaldo <coughs> Jurgela, and uh, um, his interest, I mean, I don't know how you describe the architecture, but in my way, it's kind of classic modern. And to me, it was, uh, you know, the, the way they explained the building is it was very democratic and very Australian. But, um, I'm not convinced by that. I think it's a very Italian building. Uh, and uh, um, he wanted us to develop a typeface. I mean, the building, I think, has to, had to last for 600 years. I think that was the uh, criteria that he was given as an architect. And therefore, he used, you know, all the uh, marble. I mean, a lot of stone. And... Um, he asked us if we could uh, design a typeface that was specific to the building and the kind of the Australian condition and that that typeface be uh, inscribed or etched or cut into the stone uh, to remain as um, 
inscriptions, monumental inscriptions for the end, till the end of, till the building was a ruin, I guess. Um, so, uh, knowing that he didn't really mean what he said because the building was, was to me, overtly Italian, we had to, I thought, design an Italian, uh, a Roman typeface that was simplified um, uh, in the same way that Australians simplify things. You know, we have a very basic way of looking at the world. So I was trying to um, match those two criteria. On the one hand, to make it Roman or Italian, and on the other hand, to make it Australian. And we did quite a bit of research in that regard in terms of how that might, you know, visualise itself. Um, I guess the thing is, it's, um, it's very hard to... The Roman letters are perhaps... The Roman letters that are inscribed into stone are immensely beautiful, in my opinion, and they've never been surpassed. So it was, for me, it was a task. How do you do something as well as um, your know, antiquity, the ancient Romans had, and we didn't succeed. <laughs> no, we didn't. And, uh, but we did develop a letter that could be cast, letter forms that could be cast in uh, bronze, or cast in brass, or cast in uh, epoxy, and uh, aluminium, and also incised at the same time. And uh, it's probably, it's a bit esoteric, this stuff, but let letters that are three-dimensional and that way, the Roman letters are very skillfully designed because they, they, their legibility relies on how the light hits the surface. So it's based on light and shadow in the V-cut. And then uh, to, um, to uh, it was a task. And I think it's, uh, it's been, unfortunately what happened is that the uh, panels into which the monumental inscriptions were to be inserted um, we couldn't, uh, the, the building was in front of us. We were appointed late and we couldn't inscribe the monumental letters into the, into the facade of the, the building because the building had to be constructed. <laughs> but in any event, I wasn't sure how we were going to do it because uh, it, it can be done easily now with laser cutting. Yeah. But, and there's no stonemasons here that could have done it. So it was going to have to be a kind of a mechanical process which we had to deal with, but uh, most of the letters in the end were cast into metal and applied to the surfaces rather than incised. But uh, that's it. Wow, <coughs> quite an explanation and, and you set yourself an incredibly high bar to, to achieve. Mm. Uh, you did extremely well. Mm. John, turning it back on you, there are elements in Dent and Corker Marshall's work that have graphic qualities. Do you feel that that was just part of the reason that you two um, came to work together so well? Or do you think there's been some influence that's infiltrated the work and the thinking behind the work? Look, I, I, I would have to say I think that there, it's, a, it, it's a process that went beto between us. You know, there was a, it was a two-way process. We, we learnt a lot from Gary. Yeah. We learnt a lot about um, finesse and control. And, and, you know, Gary was very strong work in typography and things like that. Which had so much to it, as he's, sort of as he's just been describing the the the, 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 the nature of typo typography, uh, you know, the discuss, talk, talk and all that sort of thing. I'm sure had an influence on it, and it, I think it just reinforced the way we thought about things. Um, 
and it fitted with that, with our, our approach to architecture and the way we wanted to do things. So we weren't, you know, we were we were of a type. We weren't an Ashton Bragger McDougall. We weren't a Lyons. We weren't a Peter Corrigan. We were in the other team <laughs> at the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it, it was apparent too through the procession of information you gave us tonight that those things grew and formed as you both grew and formed and while you <coughs> flirted with various things through different periods of time which many people did you came through that and learnt and learnt together and I think Gary's comments about constructivism and, and mm. those background influences as well um, have informed mm. the thinking have you another well, relative to that, yes. yes. <laughs> I mean, John, you've had an incredible kind of relationship with one structural engineer in particular that you push to the limits in terms of cantilevers and amazing kind of circumstance that uh, whether it be even post your relationship with Peter, the, um, the outcome at Stonehenge and stuff, which all began a long time ago with those kind of um, propositions that any other structural engineer might have said, no way. Um, do you have some comment about that incredible journey and relationship with, uh, with Arabs yeah. through him? Well, yes, you're right. I mean, I, th I, think, I think the key to it was that we learnt that you could get if the if the instructional engineer is excited about what you're doing, then he'll push himself a bit harder, and you can push him a bit harder, and you can you can get a bit more more out of it. And I think it was it's that engagement of having them their participation and having them sort of want to do it, so um, and want to be part of it. That that uh, and we were interested in pushing. I mean we 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 saw we saw skyscrapers, we saw cantilevers as sort of being a, a 20th, 21st century sort of typology of building that hadn't existed before because there wasn't the structural knowledge to, to actually do, do it in a big way before. So to us it was one of the things we searched and tried to do was to express this contemporary sort of typology which was um, whether it's the cantilevering up out of the ground or cantilevering outwards to do that sort of thing and and we've, we've always enjoyed doing that. you know. The, the, so with the museum, the 25-metre cantilevers and the, um, my house, the 9-metre cantilevers and those sorts of things, they're, they're just, they're, they're fun and I think if they're fun then the structural engineer goes with you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. John, there's an element of very strict, rigorous, geometric um, parts to the work and then there's play. And I just wonder if you wanted to explain a little bit more about your thinking behind that, or is it, is it as conscious, or is it accidental, or is it a bit of both, or? Um, Starting with the Melbourne Museum Project, for yeah. instance, that's where it became more apparent. More apparent. Yeah, look, and it's probably expressed in the way that I was talking about the Melbourne Museum as being representative of Melbourne. Mm. I mean, I think, you know, when we were when we analysed the city, when we analysed buildings that we'd done, like 101 Collins Street and things like that, which we, we sort of call a, a pinstripe, a pinstripe building, it's sort of controlled and 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 those sorts of things. But because we saw what you've got in Melbourne is you you know Melbourne's got a grid city and it's got bluestone, so it's grey, it's grey and it's gridded. Sydney's sort of all over the bloody place and and brown. <laughs> So to us, that was a, it was a contrast that, that we, were, we, we were picking up on in Melbourne. But we also saw, and it's expressed again in the museum, but we saw quite early on that, that the, you could do interesting things that sort of broke out, that, that sort of sparked. Mm -hmm. you, took, you accepted this basic for, formal mm -hmm. of the, you know, like the grid and the grey and things like that, and then you could do things that sparked out against it. Or, 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 and different projects would do that in different ways. But uh, you know, we were all. I think we were always drawn back to a, 
uh, I think, to our basic architectural training, which was modernism. Mm. You know, you, you sort of end up going back there. You don't get rid of it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is a nostalgic trip. Thinking <laughs> He's got notes. I Gary, uh, uh, he didn't show you the frontispiece to the library book, which said, printed on a very small note, with thanks to Bob Nation, who suggested that we do this book. But the PS would have been, what a wanker because it lost us so much money. <laughs> <laughs> but I must say that um, having worked with Gary from my Tasmanian practice until I got to know John closer was uh, always, always an incredible joy. And um, he, Gary always brought an incredible kind of um, lateral view to process. Back in the, I'm not quite sure it was the 80s or the 90s, you introduced me to Walter Alner, yeah. who was the most beautiful man from New York, a graphic artist. And perhaps you might comment on kind of the influences that um, have affected your process, apart from the um, fear and loathing trip across the <laughs> States driving into Chicago. Um, I have no formal education at all in, uh, in design, in anything, really. in anything really. <laughs> yeah, so um, it's been uh, a bit of a journey to try and understand what the hell uh, I'm doing and connecting the dots. It's been a slow process. Um, which would have been fulfilled much better had I had some kind of real education. So in a way what I've had to do is source out people who uh, I admired and to build relationships with those people and form a dialogue um, and gain assistance from people who are much better informed than me. So one of my great mentors was uh, a fellow by the name of Les Mason who came from Los Angeles. Um, he was uh, highly intelligent, a drunk, a womanizer, and uh, uh, an amazing graphic designer, I have to say. So he became my mentor, and I think I uh, spent, I travelled with him frequently, and from that I learnt uh, more about art and design uh, in a short period of time than uh, I'd learnt trying to muddle my way through. Um, but in the beginning, uh, I think uh, where I grew up in Perth, there was no culture at all, and certainly no design culture. And I grew up in the 50s, and there was no information about graphic design. So um, I sourced my information from reading books on architecture and books on uh, art. And I became more knowledgeable, I think, about those two topics than I, than I was about graphics until later in my life. Um, why am I telling this story? You've got to get around to, <laughs> to, to, to talk to you about Walter. Oh, Walter, yeah. yeah. Anyway, I, I, uh, in 1979, I met uh, Walter Ulner, who was a, uh, uh, trained at the Bauhaus School in Germany uh, when he was 19. And he worked with, uh, well, he his lecturers were Joseph Albers and uh, uh, Wassily Kandinsky, um, Marcel Breuer, um, all those famous mm. modernists of that time. So he also became a, a kind of a friend 
and uh, a bit of a mentor. He was also connected to all the famous New York school in America. He was uh, friends with Robert Rochenberg and, uh, and uh, the Dutch guy, what's his name, de Kooning, and uh, you know, a whole range of people like that. Uh, he then he went on to become the art director of Fortune magazine in New in New York, and uh, um, he introduced me to a myriad of other designers around the world. Um, I don't know what can I say. Um, it's my way of learning. That's all. It's uh, <laughs> that was a lovely story. Yeah. What's that? Uh, yeah. And uh, I think that's why I have, I have an affinity with architecture, I think. I love architecture, I love art. I love both those disciplines more than graphic design, I think. Although I do love typography. Yeah, yeah mm. for sure. I, I don't think you have too much to worry about, Gary, in terms of what you know. And no, I think... Too, it's too late. It's too late. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're almost there. You're no, almost there. A little dead. bit further. I think you'll find that many people with educations feel exactly the same way. Do they? Those that are really caring about what they do, you can never learn enough. Yeah. You're always looking, you're always Why searching. You told me that before. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you back then. <laughs> but it's okay. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> what you have done and what you do is beautiful. It is really totally. fantastic work. Mm. Uh, what you've done with John and these. Denton Corker Marshall, sorry, yeah. <laughs> um, has been fantastic, and the work that you've done with others. I, I still remember receiving um, newsletters from you with the Ant series. Yeah. You had this uh, ant that would yeah. always turn up and tell people about yeah. what you were doing. It was fantastic. Yeah. And the work that you've done in the Middle East, and the work you're doing on these tall buildings, you yeah. know, I don't think you have too much to worry about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just a, a question, though, um, and maybe we'll round out soon. I think it's almost time. Um, you touched upon the fact that, or John did, that he designed the first house and then the second house for you, but there was little explanation of your collaboration. Was it like, as you stated, with the graphics, that you really don't talk about graphics, so you didn't really talk about the house when he was designing it for you? Or was there more to it than that? Uh, oh, you want to answer? <laughs> you go for it. Yeah. We talked. <laughs> yeah. No, I think Gary had... had significant input into both those projects mm. because he was continuously wanting to talk about it, wanting to talk about the architecture, mm. wanting to talk about materi the materials and why we why we wanted to use certain materials or what all that sort of thing about how it all went together. I think it was a continuous interest and discussion that, that led that led them to be to be happening. I mean the first house I think I got paid three hundred dollars to do that. Hey. <laughs> Well, I told Far too much. <laughs> <laughs> I told you he was looking for a cheap architect. <laughs> but um, yeah, but it's led to a fruitful. But relationship. but we talked we talked about that and we got involved. I mean, Gary was reminding me that Barry Marshall and I came out and helped build the um, the mezzanine bunk in one of the bedrooms at one stage. You know, because we were just it was a continual involvement, yeah. and and I think yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. in the new bathroom in 1984. Yeah. I sanded, yes. I, I, I sanded Barry Marshall's bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's been a kind of unforced kind of process, mm. really. It's been intuitive and natural. And mm. uh, I don't know, it's a, I guess it's a form of understanding. You know, Maybe so. it follows on from what you were just saying about your desire to learn more about architecture and your love of architecture yeah. that you engaged in this process. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> oh, when now, now you tell the yeah, funny story. When, when John, uh, uh, when he's doing the second house down the coast, mm. um, uh, he arrived at our place, um, seemingly was nothing. He was, he was bringing the drawings to discuss. Mm -hmm. um, so um, nothing was said as can be the case. 
He sat there for 15 minutes with nothing said and then reached into his top pocket and pulled out a bit of yellow trace which was folded <laughs> to a size that fitted in his top pocket <laughs> and unraveled a smudged Barry Marshall sketch. Yeah. <laughs> so it's been kind of relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> It's called trust. It's here. Yeah. I mean, it's, I think it's just a willingness to understand and a willingness to, in a way, I think it's, for me it's like, in some way, to have that work, be lucky enough to have somebody with design integrity to work with is invigorating. You know, mm. I, I want to do something that's worthwhile. Mm. I want. DCM to do something for me that's worthwhile. Worthwhile, yeah. Mm. That it's an exemplar. It's an example to other people mm. about how you do something well. Absolutely. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be a big deal. <laughs> it can be simple, I think. Yeah, well, the process can be simple, simple on one level, but it is a big deal. And I yeah. think both of you have shown that you are exemplars in what you do. And we've been very privileged, as I said at the beginning, to be a part of your presentation tonight. Oh, okay. Pass on to my fellow moderator. Before he wraps up, I just want to say thanks to John publicly for giving me a redirect in a time of my life, mm. which was in 1980. He said, what do you want to do cover details for parliamentarians for? I was going to New York. He said, come with us to Hong Kong. And that was the beginning of a whole new experience for me. So I say thank you and for introducing me to Akia Makikawa. Now that's a whole other story. I just want to say that publicly. And I'd just like to add that at the time when Bob agreed, we didn't know that he was going to bring half of Tasmania with him. <laughs> <laughs> and some of them are sitting up yeah, the yeah. Three, three, <laughs> couple, of, couple of directors <laughs> still, dire still there. So thank you both. Um, this has been a wonderful evening. Please put your hands together to thank our guests.